Yemoku sandori ya masi katara di ana shikiti ni ya masi kunda rabadi ya dada. Oh glorious God, we praise your name. We lay our crowns and worship you. Oh glorious God, we praise your name. We lay our crowns and worship you. Oh, glorious Father, we praise your name. We lay our crowns and worship you. Oh, glorious God, we honor you. We lay our crowns and worship you. Oh, be lifted above all other gods. We lay our crowns and worship you. Oh, glorious God. We are your presence. Oh, we lay the crowns before you and we worship you. Oh, glorious God, we praise your name. We lay our crowns and worship. Amen, amen. Blessings and glory, wisdom, thanksgiving, and none. Power and might, it all belongs to our God. Oh, Forever and ever, amen. Power and might on to our God. Forever and ever, amen. Power and might belong to our God. Forever and ever, amen. Power and might belong to Yeshua. Forever and ever, amen. And we lay our crowns and worship you. Oh, glorious God, we praise your name. We lay the crowns and worship you. Oh, glorious God, we honor you. What a mighty God you are. We lay our crowns and worship you and everywhere we go we see you right there in the beauty of nature you shine all around for everything is you and you are everything precious jesus what a wonderful wonder you are everywhere i turn i see you right there in the beauty of nature you shine all around you are everything and everything is you Precious Jesus, what a wonderful wonder you are. Oh, 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 You are 
amazing, dear Lord. You are amazing, Jesus. You are amazing, Jesus. You're so amazing. Oh, 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 oh. and everywhere I go, all I see is your handiwork. Oh, in the beauty of nature, you shine in our heart. You're everything, and everything is you. Precious Jesus, what an amazing, amazing Father you are to us. Oh, 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 oh. oh. Hallelujah. Amen. 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 Thank you so much for that powerful session, Sister Maureen. God bless you, my dear. Good evening, sisters, and welcome to Marriage School. We thank God for the opportunity to gather here once again to learn of him, especially in this season where we prepare for Easter the burial, the resurrection of Christ Jesus. Today we want to be talking or discussing or sharing about the sufferings of Christ and how that um, in our journey with Christ, we have also walked in that same suffering to see the glory at the end. You know, the devil said in, in first. Corinthians that then if the, the rulers of the world didn't understand the wisdom that God had in mind, they would not have crucified the Christ. They did not know. And that's what happens with, with our lives. Sometimes when we go through all the challenges and the and the struggles and the fears, we realize that we don't think that we could ever come out of it. But when we look back at what we have become, we can only thank God and bless him for his wisdom. For indeed, his ways are higher. And if we would just trust him and lean on him completely, we would see that the end is surely glorious. And so we will be sharing our own lived experiences because that's how we do it here. And um, as we share, we are blessed. And um, so please feel free if you have, if you want to start sharing. Uh, we have um, our sister Mona to actually begin with us, but she's not here yet. And so um, I would kindly ask if anybody has any such experience to share with me, um, you know, like how that you have gone through something that you necessarily did not think that you could have endured. You do, do not think that you could have come out of. You do not think that, like every single time you were in it, you just felt like, I don't see an end. I do not know how this is going to be. I mean, we know our Lord Jesus Christ. We saw him walk on earth. We saw him call the 12. We saw him teach them, heal and raise the dead and do all of that. And then when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and he was calling out to the disciples and they were all tired and sleeping. And he came back and said, could you not watch with me for an hour? He felt it. He, 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 he also felt the pain. He felt the pressure. You know, at a point he said, Father, if you would, but then let your will be done. I I have been I I have been there several times. In fact, I think I am still there. But I know that um, there's also been several situations where I didn't see an end, but God gloriously brought me out. And so today we want to share how the Lord has brought us out of the seemingly impossible situations that we were so blinded by and now he gloriously showed himself forth and as I talk about this 
I actually remember the scripture in John chapter 12, verse 24, 25, where he says that unless a grain of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it abides alone. But when it dies, the fruits, oh my God, it's, it's just so glorious. And so, sisters, the floor is open for sharings. If the Lord is leading you to share a particular experience with us, kindly do so. Thank you. Sister Maureen. Yes. Sister Safar. Okay, I think I see your mind, your mic moving, but I can't hear you. Please, can anybody hear Sister Safar? Okay, please, Sister so, so far, we can't hear you. I, I can I, Sister so, 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 Informa, could you please? please set I'm not the button? Okay, sorry. I... Sisters, please, let's share, let's share what the Lord has done with us. Let's share what we have learned along the way. Let's share how the Lord has transformed our minds as we have been constantly sitting and learning of him. So Zafrin Poma, can you please unmute and share with us? Okay, so Joel, I'm not sure that I'm... I'm... So are we sharing experiences based on um, what we've learned from marriage school? Is that what, what it is? Yes, please. In regards with things we supposedly suffered and thoughts we would we could not come out of, but then God brought us through so much so that now we are actually helping other people. So my experience is not is not from marriage. So I I mm -hmm. I so um yeah but because this is marriage school it would be beautiful if it was in that regard so that many other people would be blessed and helped because what we have um overcome some people are now walking it so it would be a blessing to others so please if my question was not clear we're just talking about several lessons we have learned in marriage things we didn't think we could you know overcome but god enabled us to overcome and how that's through overcoming, we have been able to be a blessing to ourselves and many other people. Okay. All right, sis. I'll start and um, trust that the Lord would use other sisters to also share. Um. Good evening, dear sisters. So, you know, in terms of mm -hmm. things that I personally thought I wouldn't be able to overcome, and how the Lord has helped. I mean, that's that's quite a bit. But the journey of marriage itself, um, I believe that I started off with all intentions to <laughs> to be able to to do to do it right, right. Um, but along the line, as you all know, we would learn that it's not about us and our ability to do it right or not. And thinking about it, even in terms of Easter, and I heard Sister Joel share about how Christ in the Garden of Gethsemane talked about how the cup of suffering would pass him by. I mean, there are times in the past, you know, when I am, you know, there's some 
things that the Lord hadn't begun to teach me that I, I, I said to myself, you know, what am I even doing here? What am I doing in this, in this marriage? Because I didn't know what to do. But that I, I, I believe we can all relate to is because I was trying to do something outside of, of the person who instituted it, which, who is God. So the institution of marriage itself, as we all are learning, is instituted by, by God. He brought it about. He, he, he instituted it. So we can't function outside of the way he planned for it to be, you know. And I always go back to how, um, the things, even the, the material, trivial things around us. I mean, when I buy a Mercedes and I take it to a, a Nissan mechanic, I don't expect for it to function at its ultimate. Yes, it will somewhat function because they are both mechanics. But the, the peculiarities of the Mercedes may not be able to be taken care of by the Nissan. And I use those two examples because one is an everyday vehicle and one is supposed to be a luxury vehicle. So it's the same thing with marriage that if I'm learning and I continue to learn that if I don't take my challenges before the Lord, then ah, what am I doing? An example, there's so many, I don't even know which one to, to use, but so if, little little things um, like even what to say, how you I respond to something. My husband would say something Yes, I would be irritated in how I would choose to respond. And that is probably something that I believe the Holy Spirit would like me to even share more. That when when, when we are faced or when I'm what I've learned that when I'm faced with with making a choice to respond in a particular way to my husband, for instance, maybe something that I feel I've sacrificed for so long and I feel foolish, you know. In saying, consider being how long would I sacrifice for you know, you know, every day die to my flesh? How how long? I just want to share that that's thought process. That's um, should I choose A or B? Should I quote stand up for myself in quotes, or should I die to my flesh? Those options, I believe, come up in the thoughts of. A lot of people that I have at least talked to, you know, people who have gone ahead of me in terms of those who have a lot more experience than I do myself and those who also would come to me and want me to share. I realized that even the, the you know, the Reverend Minister, who is, I'm sure Pastor Alain will share, she was here. Those thoughts creep up, you know, the shall I this or shall I that? Shall I choose the silence, the dying to flesh? Not silence the way I'm saying it, but dying to flesh or shall I stand up myself? Those options come up, but it is the, it's in the, the choosing that makes the difference. Which one you choose is, is what will make the difference. And for me, I've realized that which one I choose makes a difference. Choosing life or choosing death, choosing to die to self or choosing to stand up to myself is what would generate the results. So I have learned that the way of God, the one who is said marriage, who teaches me to choose his way, which is dying to self. When he enables me, or when I allow him to enable me to choose that, the result is always great. But when I dog him and I go and choose my, my standing up for myself, I crash and then I come back to him. It doesn't mean that I, I would never make that mistake again. <laughs> sometimes I pray that I don't, but sometimes I do. But I just want us to know that when myself or maybe another other sisters who I also know say that, oh, choose this option, choose God's way of dying to self. It's not, it's not that I, I never or some of our other sisters never are faced with choosing standing up for yourself. It, that option comes, but it's in, it is in the choice. It is in deciding, how should I put it? Uh -huh. So it's, it doesn't mean that those things don't rise up in your mind. It comes, but it is in the choosing that we become a believer. You know, and I heard something from Young Cho, and he said, it is in that choice, in that instance, that you can choose to live out your life as a believer or live out or choose the life of an unbeliever. And like we've learned in Closer Workwise, there's always two tracks. There's no third one, whether we like it or not. So in that moment where my husband has done something and I'm feeling foolish in quotes and I'm feeling like standing up for myself. 
in that moment, the track that I, the option I choose to determine the track I'm on. If I choose to quote and unquote stand up for myself, I'm choosing track the other guy. If I choose to die to self and go according to the one who instituted marriage, I'm choosing track Jesus or track God or track Holy Spirit, three in one. So at any point in time, any decision I make, I'm learning slowly. I'm choosing a track. And, and so that that really has helped me to die to self more than I otherwise could have. And I believe it's the Holy Spirit helping me. So that when I really know that this thing that this guy is saying, hey, I want to say this to him, fine. You know, in that, that moment, it's not my husband, oh, he's that guy. Then the other option is, this is the man that you came before me <laughs> to love to death do you part. This is your husband, the one with whom you are one. And so you make this choice. In that moment, I have a decision to make. And I always pray for the Holy Spirit to help me to choose the option of God. And, and when that choice is made, victory always comes. Uh, I, I've shared I've shared a story about here before about how I wanted, I was out of the house at the retreat, really. And um, my children needed bread for something, for, for food at home. And they had called me because their dad um, had not bought the bread for them, though they had asked him. And I had also told him before I left for the retreat. You know, in that moment, when they told me, I had two choices. Go back to what I knew or what the world had taught me of calling him and saying, Charlie, bread, blah, 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 blah. Or choosing what I was learning and I'm still learning in Christ to say, Holy Spirit, I'm not, I can't go and get it. But if I was one, I've got to get it. The children need this bread to eat, da, da, da. And, you know, it's not like they had any other option. The Holy Spirit helped me to choose the option of not going on and on and on like what the world had taught me. And so I prayed about it. It's not something that I would have done before. But because of what we are learning here, those options you know, the Holy Spirit presented his option and the enemy presented their op his option or the world presented his, their option. So when I, choose the op when I chose the option of the Lord and I prayed, the, the children called and said, oh, okay, they found something else to eat for school for that morning. And so it was fine. But I, I said nothing to my husband when I talked to him. I didn't talk about the bread at all. I had just prayed about it and left it for God. So it says, my husband, but the children called me again because I was at the retreat. And talking about how my husband, my husband had bought so many loaves of bread that the freezer part where we put the bread was filled. That had not happened before in my household where I wanted something done and I hadn't opened my mouth to give a long lecture before the thing would not even get done. So as I continued to make these choices that the Holy Spirit presented to me, the options he presented to me, I, be, I chose them and, and they begin to work at, at a pace that is not my usual pace. But then I learned that it works. Then more and more, I'm choosing the option of the Holy Spirit and less of the option of the end of the world. But like I said, and I, I can't emphasize enough, the option of the world will still creep up. Let's not get it twisted. The option of the world still comes up. But the Bible says, choose ye life that you may live. So that option will come up. So I just want sisters, and I, I, I believe the Holy Spirit wants us to know that it is choices. Let's not think that there's this place where that option never comes up. That option will come up. But there's always, the choice is like a moment by moment choice. And um, that's what I'd like to share on that particular one. And also the bit about whether I should stand up to myself. You know, can I stand up for myself? I used to think I could. But as the years have gone by and the Lord has taught me, I realized that I really can't. Standing up for myself is telling my husband my peace of mind. And then what? My husband like he doesn't like talking. And then the whole thing will become a cold war. So this standing up for myself, for me, has not worked um, the whole nine yards. Sometimes it doesn't work at all. Sometimes it works temporarily because the person won't mind me and I'll think it's working. However, choosing the option of letting the Lord Jesus Christ stand up for me or letting him stand up in me has always worked. And, and, and so again, for me, it brings me, it brings me back to choose ye life that ye may live. The Lord is life. And so when he gives us options to choose, I am learning that it is always lasting. It is always 
um, it, it solves more problems, it's more, it's more victorious, it is lasting, and it brings genuine joy and peace when we choose the option that the Institute of Marriage himself presents to us as against the world's option. So let me stop here and let somebody else add on. Thank you. Thank you so much, Sister Fimfama. God bless you for sharing that. In fact, the Bible expects us to die daily to self. It's a daily die. And so we don't say that, oh, as for this one, I have conquered. Like she said, there are choices that are presented every day. And sometimes our will is so strong or we feel so justified or it makes sense to stand a certain ground because everything points to the fact that you are right but god's ways are better and like she famously shares about the bread story i mean the first time i heard the testimony i was like wow god actually does provide even bread you know so that's the thing god does and when now you see how the the matter is you know just trivialized something that could have escalated and become a problem and it just dies down nicely and you're wondering so should, could, should this have been a problem? Should this have been something worth, you know, steaming over? So thank you so much for sharing that. God bless you so much. Sister Mona, I see your hand is up. Please unmute and share. Good evening, sisters. God bless you, Stephen Puma. Um, so I just want to remind us of a few scriptures, just a few scriptures and then um, when we read Matthew chapter 24, verse 13, it says that the NIV version says that, but the one who stands firm to the end will be saved. The one who stands firm to the end will be saved. Now, what are we standing firm in? Um, in relation to our expectations of what ought to be, um, how we have planned our lives, um, how we see the future, how we made inputs into our self-development to a point where we have reached a certain level where it's a break or make. And in that situation, um, we want to be able to reap the results of everything that we have invested into in ourselves. And for that reason, um, we feel that what kind of life do I have or will I have in the absence of losing me, losing myself, losing sometimes even a career, losing, um, you know, um, my self-worth, basically um, what I stand for and um, who I am and Everything that I have worked towards, you know, um, shouldn't I get anything in return for everything that I have sacrificed in my life to be who I am? All the investment my parents made, you know, in terms of education and um, things that I have read around, um, you know, all the knowledge I have acquired. So if the Bible says that it is only those who will stand, one second, please, um, Sorry, sister. Sister Margaret, um, sorry. Yes, sorry. There was um, a short interruption. Forgive me. Yes. So when the Bible talks about it, it's only those who will stand firm to the end who will be saved. So what 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 stands is the Bible talking about? Is it the things that we have projected to be who we ought to be, what it ought to be, how it ought to be, or is it in relation to the plan that God has for us? And so when Father says that I have plans for you, plans of good and not of evil, and yet he comes to um, Philippians chapter 1. He comes to Philippians chapter 1 verse 27, and then he says that, 
for it has been granted to you on behalf. Philippians chapter 1, verse 29, it says that for it has been granted to you on behalf of Christ, not only to believe in him, but also to suffer in him. So when the Bible is talking about the things that Christ has mercifully and gracefully given to us to extend a certain level of love to us, to be able to align in belief and in oneness with Christ, then he's also saying that in that oneness, have we also accepted that aspect of Christ that also comes with the sacrifice, that also comes with a giving bit. So it is not something that we can bargain and decide that God, can we only accept this side? Father, would you love us so much that, you know, we can only enjoy the good things that, you know, we, we, we want in our lives, but then the other bits, you know, you have already done that sacrifice. So we don't need to go through that sacrifice. Yes. We do not need to go through that sacrifice in terms of paying, in terms of using our own strength because he has done all that for us and by that he has walked the work for us and so we just rely on him but to say that we are totally relinquishing that aspect of our belief system in christ jesus would be you know not to totally accept the suffering of christ on the cross also for us so now it's a total package so to stand firm to the end are those who are going to be rewarded are those also who accept the total package, both the good and then the suffering of Christ Jesus, which he himself made an example of so that we can easily pass through that path by making all our mountains straight. And so he says, I come to me, all you who are heavy laden. I don't know what it is that, you know, burdens your heart. And he says that I will give you rest, which means that there will come a time where we feel inundated by the issues of life. We feel overwhelmed by everything that we find ourselves in. And he said that in that moment, I need you to come to me because it's a joint partnership. I have walked the path and I need you to depend on me, to rely on me, even if you don't see me. And sometimes, you know, it seems as if it's so, it's so lonely. It seems as if, you know, you will never come out of it. And sisters, you realize that when you look back at some of these instances in your life, it may have lasted only for a matter of months. I know that for some people, it's a matter of years. And so you ask yourself, when? Now, the question is, would you be able to endure to the end? Because the Bible says that work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. So you realize that the onus is not on the other person to make your life easy, to make choices in your life easy. The onus is on you to be able to work it out, your own salvation with fear and trembling based on your expectations, not on now only, but in the end. He says that joy cometh in the morning, even though they may be weeping at night. So if we continuously focus on the end and tell ourselves that, Father, it is a struggle, it's a day-by-day -day struggle. But in all this, he says that I will never leave you nor forsake you. And so when I focus on the things and the price that I, 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 I wait to receive at the end of it, you see, and he says that all those that the Father has given to me, I have the ability to keep so which means that any time that because of certain choices that we make, Father is not able to keep us in check, you know, as the shepherd and the sheep, then we realize that we are falling out of line and he will not be able to cover us because we have decided to fall out of line. And therefore, his grace and mercies, even though they are still there, we struggle and decide to carry the beddings, you know, and the yoke ourselves. But he said that his yoke, which means that there is a yoke that is lighter than that which we are undergoing right now. And when we decide to swap what we are undergoing right now for the yoke of Christ Jesus, he says that that one is easier. And if you decide to lay every bedding, including, you know, the talking back, I mean, the way you think that, you know, the whole thing seemed to be looking down and undermining who you are, really, and defeating everything that you have ever worked for. You see, when I got married, um, I lived, I lived a very shielded life. My parents really were very, very, very strict. And so the times that we were even dating and I would sneak and make calls, I would sneak to go and see, meet up with him and all that. You know, I thought for some reason that I was flaunting the rules of my parents to see him and therefore I was doing him a big favor. So that's how the whole deception in my marriage, you know, started.
I had always felt along the line that I am the one, you know, who was kept. I am the one who came from this kind of background. I am the one who, 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 whose father hold in high esteem. I am the one and I have sacrificed everything just for you. And then this is what I get back. Now, to a point where when I was leaving home for marriage, my father said to me that if I went and I wasn't happy, you know, I should come back. In fact, he gave me a key. You know, the gate key that any time that I wasn't happy, I should just pack my things and come back. That was how how reluctant my father was to let me go. Because to him, he was also doing my husband a sacrifice by giving him his beautiful daughter. You see, so I had all these things cooked up in my mind in the marriage. And therefore, anything that I did was like, I'm only doing you a favor. You know, it's like you don't deserve me, sort of. And therefore, being here, you are lucky to have me, let alone you dare treat me the way you are. And with this kind of attitude, how was he ever going to pay up? How was he ever going to match up? You know, everything he did was, was below the standard. And so... The point is, after I, 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 we, we had kids and everything, at what point do you keep building up the investment in who you are for him to pay the debt? So we realized that it is a lost cause. It is a lost battle because I was not forced to the altar. I was not dragged to the altar. Out of love for him, I did. But some way, somehow along the line, all these things were vying, you know, for attention in my life so much so that I could not even see and believe that my husband loved me at some point. I thought that if he loved me, he should be doing this. And I believe that some of us are in that situation right now. If he loved me, why can't he do this? If he if he cared so much about me, why is he not helping out? Why is he not working so hard so that my work will be less? Why doesn't he wake up when the baby cries at night and also try and father, be the father for once? Why can't he, you know, but in all this, the Bible still say that it is those who continue, who, who strive to the end and take both the struggle and the belief that we have in Christ Jesus and endure to the end, who would receive the prize? So you see, it does not make room. And in fact, that Philippians chapter, the 27 says that whatever happens, conduct yourselves in a manner, where whatever, whatever happens, conduct yourself in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Then whether I come and see you or only hear about you, whether it's on closer work platform or whether it's at a retreat or whether you are home alone in your home, whether we hear of you or we don't hear of you, say that I will know that you stand firm in the one spirit, striving together as one for the faith of the gospel without being frightened in any way by those who oppose you seemingly sometimes. We feel that sometimes that everything, his family is against us. You know, the world is against us. And um, all these things, you know, pop up in our heads. And he says that by all those who oppose you, that's, uh, this is a sign to them that they will be destroyed, but that you will be saved and that, and, and, and that by God. So when we understand what is at work in the people who seemingly come in our lives and offend us, and sometimes the closest people, including our husbands, he says that they will be destroyed. Whatever it is that they are doing, the Lord is working in their lives. Just as we are accountable, so are they accountable. I'm not saying that you should rejoice in the fact that they will fall down. No, but we are rejoicing in the fact that just as we are praying and Christ is working on us because we are one as husband and wife, Christ also extend setting mercies to them. And if you believe in the oneness of the marriage, then you realize that there comes a time that it begins to rub off. You see, goodness rubs off just like evil also rubs off. And goodness, when it stands firm, the Bible says that endures to the end, always wins. So when we really will stand firm, you know, by our demeanor, by the respect we give them, by the submission, by the way of life. So I went through this day, sisters, and I got to a point where I was like, okay, God, you said that divorce is not an option. You said this, you said, I'm not going to divorce, but I'm just here. I'm shut. And I blocked myself, built walls and walls. And every time that he does something and I say, sorry, I put a block. He does something, he's supposed to apologize, and I end up apologizing, I put a block. So I realized that I was so shielded 
in that wall that I had put up, you know, around myself so much so that I couldn't feel and sense anything that he was doing. Sisters, it is not a space which is a, a good space, but sometimes we find ourselves in that space because we feel that is the right spot for us to be. We just block our emotions. We block our hearts. We don't give them cold shoulders, but it's like I'm in the marriage, but I'm gone. I'm in here, but I'm divorced. You see, Jesus searches through the heart of man. We can seem to lie to everybody around that we are still married women, but in our hearts, we know that in our hearts, we have divorced our husbands. And that before God is tantamount to it because it says that if you as much as look as the woman and lust after him, you haven't done it yet, which means that the intent also is judged by God. And so when we do these things and we feel that we are guarding our emotions, we still haven't laid it all down, laid the burden down before God. And he says that all those who are heavy laden and, and, you know, are carrying all these burdens, bring it to me. So when we build a wall around ourselves and which I did, you know, it, I, it, it worked for some time, but the strength of man shall fail. So at some point you will feel that, oh, what if he loved me small? What if I let, you know, I put down my guard a bit and then, you know, be nice small. Then, you know, sometimes even you, you, you I ended up missing him, missing even the fights that we had. I had just blocked my heart so much so that I was not responding, not because ba <laughs> my actions was based on the love of God and the understanding of the gospel, but I was fighting. It was a defense mechanism. Hallelujah. I don't know any of us who find themselves there this evening. But when Jesus died, he died. When he walked the path to the cross, he walked the path. When he carried the cross, he indeed carried the cross. When he was whipped, it wasn't cushioned. So we cannot pretend, you know, by being okay about the situation when we are not. Because then when that happens, what we are actually doing is we are handling the situation based on our own strength and being prideful about it because we refuse to lay it down before the Father who has asked us to do that. So this went on and, you know, I happied myself somehow. But there were points, like I said, that I missed the times that we had together. I missed being vulnerable. I missed all those seasons. And I realized that, no, this thing will not lead us anywhere. It will not lead me anywhere because then I might as well just walk out because this whole thing is pretentious. I'm in, yet I am not in. And all these things happening, you see, the interesting thing is that if you slap somebody, people see it. If you are angry, people see it and somebody may admonish you and, and prompt you and tell you to stop it. But when these things are happening deep within your heart and in your mind, sisters, nobody sees it. And that's the unfortunate part. Nobody will see these things to tell you that what you are doing is wrong because it's pretense and only you and your God would know. So if in your heart today you have divorced your husband, if in your heart today there are walls that have been built up because, you know, somebody sent a text one time on, posted a text one time on our old students platform and then she said that every time we forgive them and um, we love them less. And that was very true to the situation I found myself in. Because in the judgment of the situations that I had to say sorry, I wasn't the one who was supposed to say sorry, but they will make it in such a way that I ended up, you know, being the one apologizing all the time. And sometimes for the sake of peace, I'll just say sorry. But deep down within, yes, yeah, sorry, but that's it. That's another section of my heart cut off. It's not there. Every time I say sorry, it's cut off, it's cut off, it's cut off. And that thing that is cut off, I use it to build a block and then use it to pile up the wall and build it higher and higher and higher and higher. Sisters, God is looking for us. We can only depend so much on the love that a man can give us. We can only depend so much on even ourselves, our own promises. How many times haven't we failed ourselves when we decide that we want to even fast? We ourselves controlling our own hands and our own mouth. And then yet we pick food and then put it in our mouth. And yet we can't see the deficiency in the things that we do, but we see everything wrong with the other person. The work of Christ, unfortunately, is not a true work. It's an individual decision. That is why the Bible says that work out your own salvation with fear and trembling because let it not be said that you were surrounded by a cloud of witnesses and then you couldn't stand up. And let it not be said that everything that we are doing is just an act. Then you might as well just go because you are suffering double. 
you are in and you are suffering when you go to you suffer so it's like a normal suffering sisters it's amazing how we we conceive things and how we put ourselves through these things i'm not talking as someone who has endured all the way to the end but Christ says that he will never leave us nor forsake us. And it's 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 amazing always having to fall back on the love that Jesus has for us because that's the only surety we have. That's the only assurance that we have in Christ Jesus. So I would want to encourage all of us this evening. Now, wherever we stand in our marriages, whatever expectations we have. You see, we may find men who are romantic. Yes, they are romantic. Oh yeah, he's so loving, he's so romantic. And you're like, oh, hmm. but he's only romantic. He doesn't provide. Oh, the one who provides, yes, he gives us everything. Oh, but hmm, he's never there. Uh, what else? Yes, um, he's such a sweet father to the children, hmm. but he's not a good husband to me. Oh. There's always a but. There's always a but because man, in found in the nature of the flesh is insufficient. The only time we are Yeah. Sister Mona, I can't seem to hear you. No. Oh. 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 Hello, please. Can you hear me? Yes, okay, sister, I think... you are, we can hear you. Okay, thank you so much, Sister Margaret. Your hand was up. If you could please take the floor, Sister Joy. I, I will. I will call you right when she's done. Please. Thank you. Sister Margaret Duku. Yes, thank you, sis. Um, I just wanted to share just um something that I I learned from marriage that really helped me, especially in my marriage. And I was sharing this with a friend um uh, the other time that um you know, previously um you would you would call your partner all sorts of things um and I'll give an example of that. Previously I would say that oh he, my husband is maybe he's quick tempered. Um, uh, he doesn't let go of things like I had. I had names that I used to call, I, I used to let go him with, and then um, I mean after all the teachings, um, a marriage school about how to be. I mean, previous I believe that I was submissive, but you know, most of the things you were doing was because you wanted something. So you realize you been nice for a while because you wanted something, and after you go back into your old mood and um, uh, and yeah. So um, the teachings about being um. And submissive and like to the Lord, like doing it as you're doing it to the Lord, not because of what, like, not based on what the person is doing to you, but it is your, it is what you, how you behave first. And um, I realized so after marriage school, after a series of marriage school, that I changed, I decided to like actively change, actively um, um, do exactly what we do with God. And I realized there was a change. So I wasn't seeing what I used to see anymore. I wasn't calling him the names I used to call him anymore. So I, I remember I was speaking to my friend about it and I was like, hmm, who changed here? I am the one who changed. I am, the last time I, I remembered, I am the one who um, went on, uh, during a closer walk and then I'm the one who uh, um, sat and heard the teachings about something and I changed. So, does it mean like oh, it was a bit of a confusing moment for me? And I was like, so does it mean what was I the one making him what I was calling him, or was it because of my old self that made me feel like it was? I was it was a, a very um, lovely thing to realize in the first place that I didn't realize that because I was asking myself, so the, all the names I was calling him, where did they go? Because he didn't change. I don't think he did. I don't remember he 
well, he's still the same person, but I see things differently because I changed. I I don't I don't I don't know. It's very it's very strange how if you wholly um submit to the word of God, it makes other things very easy. You know, previously you used to you know you're not talking to him, you guys have a fight, but you just want to make amends and you know, you just do things on the surface because you are doing to please him. But then when the posture changed and everything became about my God, like it became a whole different thing that I don't even realize the things anymore. Like, and I'm saying this really humbly. I don't really realize certain things anymore. Like, and family, it's, it's not as if like I'm dead to the things that happen around me, but um, I try to be more grateful. It's something I remind myself all the time to know my position, to know what I want, to know who I am. And it really makes a difference. And if you read Matthew chapter three, and sorry, Matthew chapter seven, verse three to four, he says, "Why do you look at a speck of sawdust in your brother's eye and pay no attention?" to the plant in your own eye. How can you say to your brother, let me take the speck out of your eye when all the time there's a plant in your in your own eye? So that was but that is what I have been doing all along and I keep complaining. You are this, you are that. I felt comfortable to complain about someone else's behavior in my old my old behavior. And even if I did change, it was because I'm changing for something and I go back to it. And more often we complain that I have done everything. I have done because what the everything we are doing is to please the person, it's for the moment. So the motive behind it is not even right. That is why you get tired. But when the motive changes, like um 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 it's like it's almost like it's you know, it's almost like it is it is a testimony. When the motive changes and it's it's about Christ, it's about who you are. Like now I'm I'm even worried that oh I don't want to be a hypocrite. Like whatever you be we are being taught, like if you apply it, the flesh will fill you, but you have to always pray and ask for grace. And it does work. One thing I learned in marriage school that has really changed things. There, there was a time that my husband actually said, something happened. I was like, oh, yeah, fine. And he was like, oh, you're yeah, not going to be angry and start talking. Like, it was that bad that he was actually surprised that I wasn't going to act up. And I was asking myself, oh, so was I acting up because of this one too? Like, really? <laughs> so it's, it's, it's me. I am the one who changed. And I was the one who was complaining about someone else. And that person never changed. But it was when I changed, that was when I saw the, the change in my marriage. So sometimes we really need to remove the speck from our eyes, not some of it, but all of it, and continue to focus on the speck in yours, because it might come back. So continue focusing on your speck and make sure you, you remove it. So you can do all by the grace of God. And um, sometimes it's difficult. You feel that, why am I the one doing everything? Why am I the one doing everything? But move the focus from the person because if the focus is no more to please the person, but to make sure that you're in the good books of God, it's it's going to be very different. Like you, you wouldn't, I'm, I'm sure that it's easier said than done. What I'm saying, it sounds very easy. And like I said, I didn't even realize it until I was discussing with my friend not long ago. I was like, I was the one who changed. He didn't change. So was I the person who was the problem? So yeah, that's, that's what I, I just wanted to share um, something that I learned from marriage school. That really, really, and it, it's 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 not just my home. It's it's it applies to most people. I don't call my friends the names I used to call them anymore. Like sometimes I'll say, "This is my friend, she's she's some way be too much." Like I don't, like it doesn't really, like think those things don't come up anymore. Like I don't feel that way anymore because at every point in time, the mindset I have about that particular person is different. Yeah, so that I'll just end it here because that's someone else who also also share. Thank you. Sister Margaret, God bless you. God bless you so much. As you were talking, I'm like, this is just what I am thinking. This is me. Like, you're literally telling my story. And I couldn't agree with you more. Like, we are changed. And it's so obvious. Like, you look back and like, what was I even thinking before? Like, the things that you would re react to, you don't even react to them like that anymore. And before, if somebody had said, it was you, you never agree. But you see, when the word, you allow the word to do a work in you, your mind is renewed and you are transformed. And then people now begin to look at you and wonder. You even wonder at yourself. So yes, we are changed and we are continually being changed into the perfect image of Christ. Thank you so much for sharing that. Sister Joy, please, um, the floor is yours. All right, good evening, everybody. 
Um, mm -hmm. I've, been, I've been listening. I'll say for every one of you who has contributed, God bless you. God really bless you. And as I was just listening, I just want to share a word to add a little of the topic that is going on as the Holy Spirit directed me in the book of Job, chapter 36, verse 15. I'm reading from Good News Translation. Uh, it said, but God teaches people through suffering and uses distress to open their eyes. When you read down a little bit from verse 21, it said, be careful not to turn to evil. Your suffering was sent to keep you from it. Remember how great is God's power. He is the greatest teacher of all. No one can tell God what to do or accuse him of doing evil. So uh, aside from this very verse, as we are just discussing, the Holy Spirit directed me there. And I just see how amazing God's love is towards us. You see, the truth of the matter is that sometimes we don't see what God seeks. We, we tend to see ourselves. And the moment we try to put ourselves in the place of God, that is the time we begin to struggle. And no matter how we struggle, until we have decided to do it his own way, we're not going to have any way out. So um, he's a great teacher. Sometimes he, he allows us to pass through these things. Personally, I myself, <laughs> as the second sister that I spoke with before this last person, you know, we're just like speaking about me as well. Sometimes you, you, you just allow this thing to be in there. But, but in other self, you, you are not just who you think you are. You know, people will see you and think everything is cool. But inside there, you are just struggling. You are just struggling to get better. You are just struggling to be happy. You know, when you know that you, 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 you are right, you also try to admit that you are wrong. You see, these are the suffering that we go through. And that verse actually opened my eyes and see that I think God is just trying to draw us more closer to himself. He just wants us to know what he has in stock for us. Sometimes we allow our nature to control the situations and we put all the effort trying to do it by ourselves. But the Bible didn't teach us that we can do all things through us that strengthens us. That he said we can do all things through Christ that strengthens us. So I, I believe when we allow God to have his way, he's going to make everything beautiful at his own time. I think that was just what the Lord is trying to speak to me. His love overshadowed the heart, the pain, the suffering. If we can just focus on the love of God upon our life and allow him to have his way and do what only him can do. Because the truth of the matter, he brought us together. He knows the purpose of which he brings us together. Yes, uh, sometimes you think you are trying to express yourself because that's actually what is happening to me. Sometimes like the other person is not seeing what I'm trying to communicate. It's, the, it's not that I'm trying to express hate or any other. I just want to let you to understand that this is what I'm going through. But even in that, you see, I you just see that you, you are trying, but <laughs> it's not coming forth. I think that is when we needed God the most. And if we cannot just open up ourselves and allow the word of God to guide us, it may seem foolish in the eyes of some people, but the truth of the matter, the Bible said, it confirmed the foolishness of this world and make it wise. So if we can just follow his word and begin to focus more on the love of God, not on the love of men, on the love of God that God had for us, the blood that he shed on the cross of Calvary. I would say even while we are yet sinner, he died for us. That is the extent of that love. That is essence. If we can just think about it, I think we, we can be able to set ourselves free from all this stress and frustration that the devil is trying to put on us. Because the plan of God for us is actually for good. You know, when you I, I, I begin to learn that when you do it God's way, there's always a positive result. There's always a positive result. There's always a positive result. So I just want to add to this topic, and as the Holy Spirit led me. Let's allow the great teacher to keep teaching us. Anytime that we lack the strength to move on, we should be able to depend on his word. His word cannot fail. The word system can fail us. Self can also fail us. But I don't believe the word of God can fail us. It, it may not be uh, as you wanted it, okay? But the truth of the matter is that when you lean on his word and when we depend on his word, his word will surely see us through. And at the end of it all, we'll be more than a conqueror. So this is just what I wanted to add. And I pray that the Lord 
as the Bible said that he did it to open our eyes. He will open our eyes. He will lighten our eyes of understanding to see things the way he sees it and show us the right path to follow. God bless you. God bless you. God bless Thank you so much for that. We can hear the word, but if we do not allow the Lord to work in us, we remain the same. Thank you so much. If there's anybody before I call on Sister Oswa for the next question, sisters. Hi, Sister okay. Hi. Okay. <laughs> I wanted to add a little bit to the conversation and then afterwards I'll read the question. Um, okay. When you read 1 Corinthians 1 verses 25, it talks about how God sees foolishness and how he sees wisdom. And um, let me read the, the scripture quickly. So it says in the, the NIV that for the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom. And the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Okay. And in our human reasoning, there are things that we do which uh, we, we reason are foolish, which actually God admires and God looks on and says, that's my girl, that's my lady, that's my daughter, you know. And then there are things that we actually think that we are doing that he's, he sort of frowns on and says, mm, it's not going well today. And we've all gone through that. I myself have gone through that where I'm doing something. My insights are literally like feeling like, Oh, this thing that I'm doing, I'm making a fool of myself, you know, but at the end of the day, it's, it's a three person relationship, you, your husband and God, and God is always with us. There are times that when I do something, I feel like, Oh, I really messed up. God is not going to be happy with this one. And then there are times that when I do the opposite of the thing that I really want to do, knowing that I'm pleasing him, I feel good within myself that, oh, I think that's God one. I've done, I've done a world today. At the end of the day, we are also examples. God, there was there were times that I used to think that my 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 I didn't used to see my relationship as the trial. I thought that the trials would be other things. You see, and I like what Sister um, Mona said about seeing yourself a certain way because all these things cloud our understanding and then cause us to also respond in certain ways. Um, the Word of God talks about, the, it says, I think, in First James 1, 25, about the Word being a mirror. And then if we look in the mirror and then we go away and forget what we're supposed to do, it's like someone who came to look in the mirror and forgot what he looks like. But unfortunately for us, we, are, we, we, we carry other mirrors in our everyday lives. We carry the mirror of our friends' words and the mirrors of our friends, um, of, our, of our own achievements, of what society says we are. We carry the mirror of where we went to school and how we, we judge ourselves to be. And... Even with our generation, we carry the mirror of, you know, um, you're a woman, you are strong, you know, be this thing. And sometimes you realize that it's it's all of these words and mirrors are opposing what God is really saying, where he's saying, be meek, because that is where I will raise you up. And it's very true. I myself, I struggled for a long time. I, some of the, the things that I used to hear on Closer Work, I was like, how am I going to achieve this, this one day? It won't work. You understand? But when you fought so hard in your own strength and finally you are standing in a place where you realize that all I've done has not worked. Let me try something else. And you try that something else and it works. It's It comes as a, as a surprise, but it's almost so simple. And that is just how God's word is. It's almost so simple and we get surprised by the results, how well the results come out and that it's, it's, it, it feels like, how did this happen? Anytime that I've not bother myself to you know fight and struggle and you know say some my husband comes around sometimes i'm like okay i didn't really need to do anything here did i and that's exactly how it is we need to stop looking at, at our own selves and get away of that thing of self 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 looking at just you in your own strength because in our own strength really it doesn't work it doesn't work 
and we are all working different journeys, but the journey is really the same. And when we really begin to look upon Christ and look to him, that's when we get our strength. And we are able to be propelled forward in much more, uh, in, in, in less of our efforts and further of a distance than what we plan that we will do. Do you understand? So that is my little contribution to it. And I thank you all for all that you're adding to it. This is, this is really, really, really fantastic. Thank you. Um, thank you, second, Chris. Thank you. The second question says, how long, how long does this process take? That is the process of sacrifice. How long does this process take? I feel like I've sacrificed forever and I'm not seeing any results. Thank you. Sister Fiona, please, I see yes. you. you are... This one really caught me to take this one. <laughs> yeah, this one, um, because <laughs> I'm, I'm walking this journey too. So, yes, um, powerful. I, I, I think the, the feedback or what I want to tell our sister is that um, we have to consider Jesus. I mean, that's how I, I, I'm able to um, support myself, you know, when I'm going through these kind of trials, that I consider Jesus. And if I'm supposed to live as Jesus did, who even as he died on the cross, yeah. looked down at the people who were causing him harm and said, yeah. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Went to Pilate, who could have actually let him go knowing that he was even paving the way for not only the Jews, for, but for Gentiles, you know, other people who weren't even in the, in the fold to come into the fold. And yet he went ahead and died. It, it's, it's, it's a mystery, you know, and I believe as we mature as Christians, these are some of the things that we have to embrace so that scriptures tell us in Romans 12 verse 2 that we should present ourselves as a living sacrifice and you know, it, it's sometimes we say that oh, everything scripture says, scripture says, but that is that is our foundation, that is our guidebook. Okay, so it will help that we know what the word says, so that when we are living it, we can always go back into the word and 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 realize that look, this is how the one who went ahead of us, our role model, this is how he lived. And he says we should present ourselves as a living sacrifice. And I was just chatting with a friend today, you know that living sacrifice is on the altar. And the altar has fire on it and it's burning. As a living sacrifice, you don't get off the altar. You are on there. And I think the mistake we make as Christians is that we, we tend to, I think Stephen Pomba said, it's, it's one or the other. But sometimes we tend to shift towards the world. And I mean, you can't blame us. We are, we are part flesh too, isn't it? So sometimes the flesh will come in. But the most important thing is letting the word take over that flesh. Letting the spirit take over that flesh. So that, yeah, the flesh will taunt you a little bit, but immediately then you, 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 you recognize that, no, I'm a spirit being. I'm not supposed to be living this life. So my point is, when we, we shift our, our, our focus to the world, we say, oh, why am I always suffering for this guy? Why is that it's always me? Look, it's not only your sister. I encountered the same thing today. I was even complaining to a friend, you know. But what helps me is when I shift my gaze and I, and, and I just remind myself that, look, Jesus went there, and he gave himself up and he would do it over and over again, lay down his life for us. And, and then she says, will we do this forever? And she says, give us a forever. But you see, if we also realize that we are not seeking accolades from man, we're doing it to receive the victory from our father who can bless us more than anybody can bless us. So that when you shift your focus and then you realize this is how my father wants me to live my i can bet you my sister your victory will come i've been here long enough i've seen stories i mean I've, I've heard stories i've seen with my own eyes how god has called men back into the fold because we have obeyed so that so far as it concerns you please just keep doing what the scripture tells you to do first peter 3 i mean as for that scripture you can't get away from it just keep doing what you have to it's painful but you're on the altar. That altar, that fire burns. It has to burn before you are cooked. So, my sister, that's my advice. You stay there. And I just want to tell you that you are not alone. You are not alone. But you know, 
there are several things under underpinning what is happening. We know that marriage signifies Christ's relationship with the church. So that as soon as we are in there, the enemy comes. He is coming to taunt us. He's coming to cause trouble. But he did the same with Jesus. And if, and if we we want to follow our own model, despite the trials, the tribulations, because he's told us in John 16, 33, that in this world, we will have trouble, but we have overcome the world because he has overcome the world. And because he lives in us, we have the power to, 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 to prevail, you know, because the, the father and the son, they live in us. So, I mean, I just, when I heard it, I was like, no, I need to tell the sister that you're not alone. I, I mean, it happens to us. You're not alone. And, and, and it happens because there's an enemy who doesn't like the beauty of what comes out of a beautiful marriage. You know, he wants to, because it, it symbolizes Christ's relationship with the church. He doesn't want that perfect picture to be seen. But guess what? You are the one who has been put here in closer work to learn what you need to make your marriage work. And it, it's not meant to be rosy. I, I think we were given a wrong picture of marriage from the start. We go in there thinking fairy tales and roses and, and all those things. No, no, no. We're going to go in there to sacrifice their lives and be like Christ. And our God has a perfect picture for us. Perhaps God knows that you, I mean, not perhaps, he knows that you are the one who's in there to win your husband's soul over. So you have to die, like Jesus did, so that as he, he, he won the victory for us, if you win the victory for your husband, one day you'll be here testifying like other sisters have done. I think I'm talking too much, but this, this is it. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for sharing that. Does anybody else wants to add to that? Yes, Nana Uswa. Can you mute? Okay, thank you so much. But to add to what Sister Fiona said, um, and even back to the question, I think the lady was saying that she's not seeing any any results. And that is one deception that I've learned to, to cast down. Because sometimes you will not see, but it is working. It is your victories, yeah. that you see. And um, Fiona talked about victories. There we there's so much. There's so much that you are fighting for. We fight for not just the present, but we also fight for the future. We fight for our children. We fight for their gener their our grandchildren, generations that we will not see. Great great grandchildren. There are many. There are many victories that we stand in for, and and God can use one individual. God can use us. God can use you to create a, a change in in the family line to cause if you win that victory, others will also be free. Your children don't have to go through that. Your grandchildren don't have to go through that. So I began to think along those lines, realizing that if I walk through certain certain challenges and through Christ, I'm able to do those challenges. My, my grandchildren will be free. I began to think about my grandchildren as well. And and that is how it, it should be. Sometimes you don't see you don't see it in present time because we only see in part. You get it. But there are there are things that there are victories that God is 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 taking care of. Every time that we 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 walk his path. Every time that we die to self, we do something that he, we don't say those words that we really want to say. We don't fight those fights that we really want to fight. We do it his way. He's able to gain ground for us and for his kingdom as well. Do you get it? That's all I want to ask, sister. Thank you. Please, and I just wanted to add, or oh, somebody else has their hand up. No, no. Oh, okay. okay. You can, you just add and then we call sister if we're well, to, I, I was continue. reading something today and, and mm -hmm. it really resonated with me because I feel like sometimes I'm stuck in the place and I'm not moving ahead and um, what I read was you know if you don't win God God moves us level by level so that if if you do not move you do not win this level 
he will move ahead. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. So we, we need to we need to pass God's way, and God's test won't come easy like you know things that you just jump over. No, you know the path that leads to life is is supposed to be narrow. It's supposed to pinch you small, so that it, it's time to recognize when these things are happening. Now look here, you have to pass one test before you move to another level, and that is sometimes that is why we feel like we are not seeing results. It's because God is teaching us a lesson that he wants us to grasp and move on with mm -hmm. the next level so that if we are not allowing ourselves to, to, to learn, then we'll keep writing the test over and over again. And you realize that in one spot and your eyes are telling you that the person is not changing. But meanwhile, God is asking to look at other things. Mm. Yeah. That is so true. That is so true. And that's why we, we see ourselves in cycles, on ending cycles, and we keep pointing to the other direction when in fact we should be pointing to ourselves. So let's 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 allow the Lord to help us and let's quickly align when we are nudged that this is the issue. God bless you, Sister Fiona. Sister Ifa J, please, the floor is yours. Thank you, sis. Um so this is um this is a really good question, sis. And like Sister Fiona said, we are all on this journey. And as for how long it takes, it takes until, <laughs> until the Lord calls us. But um, when this question was raised, the thing that the Lord um, reminded me of is the second part where she says, I'm not seeing any results. So mm -hmm. the first result that you would see is your desire will change. And so instead of asking God, how long does it take uh, for this process of me sacrificing? What you need to first and foremost ask our Father to do, and it's for all of us, and we are all on the, on the path, is change my desires. Because there is this desire that the flesh has um, to be right, to, to be selfish, to you know to be interested in my own interests or to focus on what makes me feel good and the wisdom of the world makes us believe that that is an okay desire but the spirit of god tells us that our desire has to be like jesus that's the desire that i want so for me personally every time i feel like oh my god what is this oh ooh, ooh, ooh. The first thing that occurs to me to pray about is, Father, change my desire. Change the way I feel about this right now. Because if my desire changes to be, I want to be more like Jesus. I want to do as my Father says. I want my Father's will to be important to me in this minute. Suddenly, it doesn't become about, oh, when is he also going to sacrifice? Oh, why does he do that? Oh, why am I doing this? Why am I? It becomes more about, is this what you want me to do, Father? And then whatever you want me to do, and as you enable me to, I will. There is a verse that the Lord put um, on my heart, and I'm going to read it. Sorry, I'm, I don't have my glasses, so please bear with me. Um, and it's a verse that is in Second Peter 3, 9. It says, the Lord is not slow to fulfill his promise, uh, as some count slowness, but is patient towards you, not wishing that any should perish, but all should reach repentance. So typically, when I am focused on what is somebody else doing, ooh, when is that person going to change? Ooh, when is this situation going to change? Because there are three levels in which we, we actually judge. We, sometimes we judge ourselves, but in this situation, we are not judging ourselves. We judge the other person. What is he doing? What is he not doing? And the third scenario is we judge the situation. Now, every time I feel like, ooh, what is he doing? And why is the situation not changing? Remember this verse, God is slow. No, God is not slow to act, but God is patient with you and I. So the patience is not about me if we're being patient with my husband. It is actually a distorted view. <laughs> That's the reason why it's very important to ask God to help me to even change the way I'm looking at the thing and what I'm desiring in it. In fact, what is going on is that I am the one who is slowly changing. Because as I change, as I think it was Sister Mag Margaret that said it, 
as I am changing, the situation actually changes. The other person changes. So when I feel like, oh God, ooh, ooh, what is this? Why isn't it changing? What do, what? It, it, it's, it's not even about the other person. And our minds and our understanding is so limited in situations that sometimes when God reveals a little bit more to us, we get so shocked how wrong we got to the situation. And that's why Peter Margaret was saying, I don't think the other person changed. I changed. And suddenly the situation seemed to have changed. And most of us here, we have experienced it before. And yet there are some situations where we still insist that the other person has to change. Or we still insist that, ooh, it, is, it looks like it's taking long. It looks like I'm the one sacrificing. Sweet sis, you and I, we are not even the ones doing the sacrifice. It is the spirit of God in us. It is God himself enabling us. It is God's patience towards us. It is God looking at us and waiting for if we are to get to the point where her desire changes. So the question is not, oh God, what is going to happen? Oh God, and I know we all ask those questions. Sometimes you look at the matter and say, hey, what is this? What is going on? When, oh, that bang, that bang. The question that God wants us to ask in situations like that is, Father, when will my desire change? When will my desire change? And sometimes I get anger in my spirit when I see myself and I see how far the Lord is taking me. And yet there are some situations where I am still like, you know, ancient of days, <laughs> not changing. I am still like an ancient rock, not changing, looking at the situation exactly the way myself, my flesh wants to look at it. And when I see situations like that, the anger that comes in me is, oh God, help me. When will if we desire change? When will if we get to the point where sacrificing for Christ is the, you know, it's the pleasure and I want to do it and I'm enjoying it and I am grateful and I'm desiring it. When will I change? Instead of when, when is the guy going to change? Because when God tells me to change my desires and tells me to sacrifice, it is because there is a gem that he's building inside me. Because that change is going to unlock something great in my life. That's what I have learned. It's not even about the guy. It's not even about the marriage. It's not about the situation we are dealing with. But it is a training ground for me myself. So the issue is not when is it going to happen. The issue is when if what gets there, suddenly the doors are unlocked. They are open. And then I realize, Ooh, was this what I am missing? And so that's the reason why Sister Fina is saying that this journey, Tale, we are all on it too. And that's the reason why we also get very humble and realize it's not about, oh, if one has reached level 10 and, you know, or if one is on level negative and somebody is on level 200. It is the reason why the Holy Spirit reminds us to ask for daily bread because I depend on God helping me. Even when I get to level one, on level one, I will still depend on God moving me to level two. On level two, I will still realize that there are some days I'm saying, what is this? He's not changing. The matter is not changing. And I still need to depend on the Holy Spirit to move to level three. So it is a continuous journey. And it is so beautiful because if God were to put a cap on it, most of us, we will feel it. And that's the reason why he's patient with us. And we think he's slow. No, he's patient with us. And he waits for us to go step by step through it as our desires change. And as our desires change, like Sister Margaret, Sister Mona, and the others were saying, the whole matter, it looks very differently. There is a saying that even the world says that when you change what you are looking at, what you are looking at changes. And that's exactly what happens here. So the more I feel like, oh, the thing I'm looking at hasn't changed. What does it mean? I haven't changed the way I'm looking at it. It means nothing, you know, there's some change in me. So when you say nothing has changed, sis, it's not true. You know it. You and I know it. Because you know that you are doing it. You are reading the word. You are asking the Holy Spirit to help you. So why are you saying it's not changing? Because then you are claiming that even you, you have not experienced the goodness of God in it. So this question is a very, very good question because all of us, we are on that journey, Charlie. Every day, all day, we depend on the Holy Spirit. Every day, all day, we, we cry out and ask God, help me change my desire. That thing that I want to feel like, oh, somebody should say some, some particular words for me to feel good. It's not a good desire. It is a desire of my flesh. And so as I subject that to the Holy Spirit and I move on, the next one comes. The Holy Spirit helps me again and I move on. God bless you, sis. God bless you so much, sis. Wow. Thank you so much for sharing that. Um, in fact, I think we will just go on to the final question from here. Sister Ousua. Yes, please. Okay, so today's final question says, 
what can I do to remain committed to this work? It's so hard for me. My husband never apologized, and all he does is take and take and take. I'm drained emotionally, spiritually, mm -hmm. and physically. Some days I don't even want to get up. Hmm. Sister so for I think Sister so for Jay, could you please? Um, um... <laughs> so okay, so basically, when I heard it, all I wanted to—I think I didn't listen to the question, well, but all I wanted to say to our sisters is not true. You know, when the Holy Spirit hmm. whispers to us, "Oh, I'm some days I don't want to get up," I mean, rebuke, rebuke, rebuke the devil. Um, and I know that is your reality. You know, when it comes to the physical realm, but in the spiritual realm. You have to deliberately rebuke these kind of thoughts, you know, because what the devil does is that he starts us on these thoughts, these spirals. And then if you don't stop the, if you don't break it with a word of truth, it can go on to a place where your whole body believes it. And then you actually cannot get out of bed. You are there, you are feeling some way. So it's not true, sis, you know. I know that what is really going on is that maybe you are exhausted. That's the reason why the Lord Jesus tells us, come, come and get rest in me. So when we get to a place where we are feeling exhausted, you, you know, your flesh has reached its limit and it's a beautiful place to seek, you know, the real source, which is Jesus himself. He says, come and rest. So if, let me continue from what I was saying earlier, that whenever I feel some way, personally, whether it is happening in my head or in my physical or whatever it is happening, whatever way it shows up, the Holy Spirit helps me to remember that this is my sign that I should seek him. I should desperately seek him in whatever way. So you say, how do you do it? Just pray in the minute. And I keep saying these four words, Holy Spirit, help me. Sometimes the, the devil makes us think it's a very complicated prayer I need to pray. Or I need to remember something very complicated in the midst of a place where I am already exhausted and I'm tired and I don't know what to do with myself. That's not true. All you need to remember is help. Holy Spirit, help me. And when you ask the Holy Spirit for the help, you have to believe, sis, that he will help you. That's all. Very simple formula. Help me and believe he will help. So what you are feeling is exhaust, an exhaustion in your flesh. What you need is a top up from the Holy Spirit. You need rest. You need to be embraced. You need to be dipped in the blood of Jesus, in the love of God, in the embrace. You know, Sister Corridor says you need to go and sit on the lap of your father. And then just rest there and let him rock you. You know, like the way we rock our babies. That's all you need. You don't need any formula. You don't need to remember some complicated thing. I should go and do something, something. None of us remembers in situations like that. So we need to remember to first of all, shush the devil. Oh, I can't get out of bed. Oh, something is going on with me. Hey, 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 tell the devil it's not true. I will get out of bed. But in my flesh, I can't. But in the spirit of God, the spirit of God is about to help me. And then ask Holy Spirit, help me. And for you, sometimes maybe really the Holy Spirit will just leave you to lie in bed. It's okay. Maybe you say sleep. It's okay. But other times he will tell you, get up, get up, get up. My daughter, get up. He may give you a word to read. He may let a sister call you. He may let you click mistakenly on a Zoom link. And somebody, you know, Mama Augusta is praying in tongues and the tongues, will, the tongues will shake you and you get out of bed. So you are not without help, sis. And don't let the devil play chaskili with your mind. Most of us, we get into situations where sometimes the devil wants to corner us and play chastely with our mind. When you see the first sign, he's saying, oh, you are like this. Stop him. Rebuke him. And remind yourself that you have help. That's all you need. You don't need anything else. Okay. And then remember to, you can always reach out, sis. You can always reach out to, you know, to, to the sisters. You can always ask somebody to pray with you you can always ask somebody to you know just speak a word of life into you but the best formula is ask the holy spirit himself to counsel you in the minute and say help me just help me it's okay god bless you amen god bless you sis and i believe that on this note we can close the curtains on marriage school for today Indeed, we have been tremendously helped. And one thing I'm taking away is the fact that it is a continuous journey and it is a daily dying to self. We need to always choose the way 
of the Lord. And when we remember how Jesus endured and is now glorified, we can only look back and see that there's nothing but glory ahead. And as we have seen in different areas of our lives where we have been transformed and this transformation is bringing a lot of healing to other people, not just ourselves, but there are many other people connected to us. We can only know that it, it can only get better from here. And so let's just try to allow the words that we continually hear to take root in our hearts deeply so that we would bear fruits upward. And Mama Augusta, <laughs> can I please call on you to pray for us tonight to close marriage school? If you can please hear me. Hello. Yes, please. Yes. Thank you, Ma. Let's, let's pray. Father, we thank you so much. We thank you for all that you have learned this evening in the marriage school. We pray that you help us that we will not be only the hearers, but the doers. I thank you for the vessels you have used to bless us. I pray that as they have watered us, may you continue to water them also in Jesus' mighty name. My Lord, I pray that any marriage that is having any challenges, as we have heard the word of God, may, may we all apply it, that it will glorify the name of the Lord. As we are living here, Daddy, we are not living in your presence. Let your presence continue to abide with us. We give you praise, we give you honor, we commit the next section unto your hands. We pray for the grace of God, the Holy Spirit, but who continue to help us. We are grateful, Lord, in Jesus' mighty name. Amen. Amen, amen and amen and amen. Thank you so much, Mama Augusta. Thank you so much, uh, beloved big sisters, for, as usual, being a blessing to us and helping us. Sister Mavis, I hand over to you. Okay. God bless you, sir. Shall we please share the grace? <clears throat> and now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, Thanks. 